and get that back there. Cool. Good morning, Good morning, everyone. Here we are. It is day three of the Hi-Fi Summit. Uh, my name is Chana, the Techno Dad. As always, I'm here with Joe from Joe and Tell and Mike from Youth Man. And today, right now, we've got Paul Barton from PSB Speakers. How are we doing, everyone? Good, guys. Doing well. Day yeah, three, three, man. Man. yesterday. It's kind of crazy. I feel like I've been partying for some reason. I don't know yeah, why. Are, you ought to be a little sore after last night, man. You were hitting it hard. I've got a little clip to edit uh, <laughs> for, for the after party just to tease everybody about it. But yeah, man, it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I even yeah. lost I lost something here in the studio and I can't even find it from last night. So I'm, I think Squeegee <laughs> got it last night, but dude, I there were several people hitting it hard. It was pretty funny. It was great. I love it. And Patogo even got his, I think his daughter was in there. His daughter was dancing. His, yeah. I think his wife was dancing too. Oh, yeah. we, had a, we had a little dance party last night. The after party. The yeah. entire event. Uh, Techno Dad was DJing and then we had a video where we were all like, you know, competing. So just, uh, you know, having fun with music. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Yep. Yeah, we're getting some comments about the echo. Yeah, there's a little bit of echo. Maybe maybe turn it down a little bit, Paul, if you can. But um, yeah, you're gonna. We we've talked before. We've had you on our show before, so we have an idea. Uh, you know about the history of PSB and you know the technical aspects. And you know I could I could listen to that for days. I love mm -hmm. that. You know, so yeah. What you want to get into it? Is that my cue? Yeah, that's, that's it. Good. You can, however it's you want yours. to do it. We're loose here. Okay. Should I bring up your uh, presentation. It, maybe, maybe introduce yourself. That'll be a good place uh, to start. It, it, it'll sort of introduce me as I go through this. Okay. Okay. So I was asked to maybe talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, psychoacoustics and speaker design. Of course, psychoacoustics is the branch of psych of physics involving the science study of sound perception and audiology, how humans perceive various sounds. That's the Wikipedia uh, description. In this presentation, I'll be talking about the considerations and trade-offs when designing an acoustical transducer like a speaker or a headphone. Much of the devel development must include the correlation between what we measure and what we perceive. I will include some historical background from a personal perspective, along with recent developments and direction of loudspeaker and headphone design going forward. Just a little bit of history and background. Um, my background, of course, in 1972 as a violinist and engineer, I found PSB speakers and continue to lead design and development today. And this is a quote from me as a, symphony musician, and also through my involvement in sound engineering in the recording studio, I came to the realization back in 1971 that live music and recorded music, for the most part, did not accurately resemble each other. Over 50 years ago, in the same wood shop where my father spent two years handcrafting a violin for me to play, I began, or I began building speakers that was the beginning of my lifelong career. Now, just a bit of background. This is a photograph, or not a photograph. This is a painting that uh, my daughter did of a photograph that was taken back in 1963, standing in front of a, uh, a workbench where my father actually built his very first violin, and it was targeted for me. In fact, you can see up in the corner here, there's the frame or the mold that the violin gets built around before it's extracted and the top is put on. And then behind me, you can see chisels and the workbench. Um, and I'm playing the violin that he built for me. So my background is really driven by, by music. Um, yeah, so from the woodshop to the lab, uh, Critical to PSB success is our dedication to understanding psychoacoustics. While well, using one of the world's most famous acoustical laboratories in the science scientific facility of the National Research Council, NRC, 
I've been able to learn about the world of acoustics and psychoacoustics. As the first speaker company to use the, NR the NRC for loudspeaker development back in 1974 and remain and remain the most active user of the facility today. That's about 46 years. And going back to the beginning, this is actually the building back in 1972 that me and two high school buddies started building loudspeakers. In fact, today, this is a recent picture. Um, it's called the old factory, and it's sort of a uh, souvenirs kind of shop with a bunch of vendors inside. But this is the original building that PSB Speakers was founded in. And it's just in a small town <clears throat> northeast or north of uh, Kitchener Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. And then in 1972 or 1974, um, anyway, PSB gathered acoustical research knowledge and sound reproduction perception starting in 1974. And that was at the uh, National Research Council. Um, this was when I was introduced to Dr. Floyd Toole who I had a great fortune to learn from and become uh, a great friend. Now, NRC is a, well, it, and here is a book that uh, Floyd has published, the third edition called Sound Reproduction. And for those of you who want to really dive deep into the world that I experienced, um, certainly in the beginning, and then in 91 when Floyd moved to Harmon, he uh, continued to do his research in uh, uh, acoustics and psychoacoustics and sound reproduction. I'm gonna play a little video that uh, is um, uh, kind of outlining the approach that PSB took in the facility, uh, which is the Anacoa Chamber at the National Research Council. Uh, I have to maximize the screen to play it. Is that still showing everyone? Yeah, it is. Now this is, uh, can everyone hear and see? Yes. Um, so these are some of the things that occur at NRC. This, keep in mind, this video was done back in uh, 95, around 95, 96. So it's quite an old video, but it still shows what some of the activities at NRC are when it comes to uh, research and development. Um, this is uh, obviously medical, uh, fisheries, uh, agriculture, um, building research, they study construction of things and fire, that sort of thing. The design of the hulls of boats. Even have the water moving instead of the boat. The main stimulus for creating the National Research Council was to help Canadian technology compete with technology around the world. And because of Canada's population, the critical mass the U.S. had was difficult to compete against on this. Canada could form some kind of technological think tank to help Canadian industry compete for a while. The National Research Council started in 1916, and the purpose of NRC was to help Canadian industry and technology compete around the world. In Canada, they, they formed the National Research Council which is basically a think tank employing about a thousand PhDs in all of the sciences. And the main campus is where I am today, which houses about 65 buildings uh, going from chemistry to uh, microstructural sciences, better known as physics, right through to uh, biotechnology and aerospace. The biggest advantage that I believe and to see that's against other acoustical setups, even one that we might even consider building ourselves, is that not only are the physical resources at the National Research Council, but the 
there is a strong history of research for humans, not to mention the fact that there are many people who can specialize in acoustic detective research, which are strong resources which can be utilized here in national research. So it's not just a physical laboratory, it's a whole resource with PSD and other Canadian technological companies can use to help improve the just to point to one of the accomplishments that have been identified here in the acoustics division of the National Museum, the strongest recognition, certainly in the consumer market, is all of the research that went on between 1974 roughly and 1984, which profiled much of the research which we apply today in the The results of those tests, which were correlating suggestive evaluations, just in speakers against measuring those speakers. Number one, keep in mind these are blind screen listening tests. And by that I mean the listeners don't know what they're listening to, and they just ask to make judgment and keep score. Number one, most of the people, most of the time, agree on the relative quality of the group of blind speakers. So if I put four speakers in, in a get a group of people um, to listen and do scoring, I would find that they would all gravitate toward one speaker versus other. The second thing that we have learned is that musical experience and musical taste are no prerequisites for being a good judge of What that means is that you don't have a team. In fact, most people can hear good quality versus lesser quality. The third thing that we've done is that properly interpreted set of objective measurements for all the tests that we do in this chamber, which include frequency response, both the on axis, off axis, total sound power, distortion, all kinds of harmonic and modulation, that those measurements that are done properly and interpreted properly correlate directly. At the beginning of this research, we had to define what it is we were trying to achieve. So he has me, as always, and always will, for lack of a better way to describe it, design loudspeakers which are true to nature. There is nothing added to what is in the music, and there is nothing taken away that was intended in the music. And that's what a speaker should be. It should be a window to what we see. Just like a glass is what you see through the window without any tint or any coloration, which are sometimes spectacular, sometimes bigger than life, but they're not natural. We like to think that our speakers are true to nature. That is the goal. That is the objective of the expert. So, um, I hope everybody heard that. Yeah, it was a it was a little rough. Uh, what was that? The end part. What did you say there? The goal of uh, PSB speakers. Well, the goal the the goal is to produce music which is true to nature. Where true to nature. Nothing added to or nothing taken away from the original recording. Am I still sharing the screen? No. I think you closed out of it. Yeah, so yeah, it was a little bit hard hard to hear, but um, maybe next time, maybe, I don't know if you can turn up the volume on the video itself, maybe. Okay. I um, think the hard part is is it's trying to come through StreamYard, which is not really designed to have audio through PowerPoint, so. Yeah. Yeah, well, check it it's okay. Challenge oh, technology. <laughs> right. Exactly. I mean, if you want to uh, uh, send one of us the actual file, for that uh, presentation, we can put it online for people to download or check go. out later. You That'd know, be awesome. That's always an idea. Or just um, the video. You can send me the video, and I'll upload um the video link yeah, to there it. There you go. Mm -hmm. See, we're, we'll get we're you got on we'll the get fly. You guys covered. I'll figure yeah. it out. <laughs> All right, so here I am. Um, let me just get back to where I was. Sure. What is the? Yeah, it, it said it was a little bit uh, hard to hear, but this person says, Tristan says, I would listen to this legend mumble all day better than other people <laughs> speaking clearly. <laughs> okay, well, I guess 
I guess I could have turned the gain up, um, but I'd be happy to share that. Um, so here I have a slide that really just talks about the three conclusions that I mentioned in the video. And this is all psychoacoustic and trying to turn human beings into measurement tools to get data out of them that correlates and is repeatable. So out of these tests and keep in mind that the the work the work that was done on all of this of course was done under the uh, direction of Dr. Floyd Toole, which I was very fortunate to be able to uh, in real time participate in. And these are the, the, you know, the fundamental conclusions really pointing to the fact that um, we as human beings kind of all hear the same. It's all relative to our hearing mechanism that uh, learns what sounds are like when we're young and as we grow older, as our ears change, we adapt to those things. And um, we all kind of have the same relative view of what things sound natural and what things don't. So the conclusions were most of the people most of the time do agree on the relative qualities of a group of loudspeakers. So they tend to gravitate towards one particular sound or one type of sound, um, if that's the way you can describe it. And it turns out that musical taste and musical experience are no prerequisites for being a good judge of sound quality. And uh, what that means is that, um, you know, people who are accustomed to listening to music, uh, whether it's just listening to the music or listening to music reproduction and from a critical standpoint, depending on the time and effort they spend doing that, the result is they can make these sonic decisions and judgments much quicker than people who have never really been asked or pay attention to that aspect of what they're hearing. But given the time and some of the vocabulary which you saw in that slide where, or in that video where the person was marking down his scores and judgments of what he was hearing. Um, and then if we take measurements which i described are done in the anechoic chamber and correlate those with listener preferences there is a very strong correlation and there uh, and and the technical attributes of a loudspeaker tend to surface when you see which speakers are being chosen by people and which are not so that's a, a, a kind of correlating the listening experience with being able to technically measure and make decisions about the performance of a loudspeaker that are correlated with, with listener preferences. Oops. And then uh, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, a few psychoacoustic perceptions. Um, when designing a loudspeaker, I have to take into account that it's going to be designed in a room or it's going to be played back in a room. So even though I measure and do all the technical uh, data accumulation in the anechoic chamber, there has to be some translation of that data into what will happen when that speaker gets put into a room and what the listener uh, will hear. And one point that I'll make here is um, that at low frequencies, the, or let, let's just talk about early reflections. There, are, you know, there are three things you hear in a sound when, when, when you listen to it in a room. One is the first arrival of the sound directly from the loudspeaker to you. The other is early reflections off the sidewall, off the back wall, off the floor, off the ceiling, and all of these add up to what you end up hearing in a given sonic event, and. The, the, the third sound you hear are sounds that radiate from the loudspeaker, but don't go directly to you and don't just have an early reflection directly to you, but they kind of rattle around the room until they get to you. And we call that reverberant sound. So there's three types of sound. One is the direct sound, one is the early reflections, and the other is the reverberant sound. Let's just talk about the early reflections. We know, we know that if you're in a room and you you listen to a speaker that's flat on axis in an anechoic chamber, the first sound you get is going to be flat. When you look at what's going on off axis, 
let's say uh, the sidewall reflection. So if we take uh, this right speaker and we look at the listener somewhere a little further away than the speakers are apart, the first reflection, which the angle of incidence is equal to the reflection angle. And so you get a reflection off the sidewall. And if you measure that angle of the second sound you hear coming out of the loudspeaker, it's about 60 to 75 degrees off axis, depending on the room setup and how far they are from the wall and all of those things. But it's, it's a fairly wide angle off axis, which is the second sound you hear. So when designing a loudspeaker, it's really important to understand that, oh, let me just say also that that second sound you hear arrives very short after the original sound from the loudspeaker. And we as human beings, um, because of our brain function, actually can integrate those two signals if they're short enough in time as one acoustical event. And I'll explain a little bit about that further on. And since we hear that as one acoustical event, the timbre of the reflection versus the timbre of the direct sound are different. And what we actually hear in that acoustical event is the combination of the timbre of both of those signals. So if the off-axis response is profoundly different than the on-axis response, then we hear the timbre of the combination of those two, which is not ideal. Uh, I could talk about this kind of phenomena at great length, but I'm just trying to say that there's a lot of attention that must be paid to off-axis response, and even as far off-axis as 60 to 75 degrees. What happens in a typical speaker where you have an 8-inch woofer and a tweeter, for example, a two-way system, the woofer starts to roll off because of its size uh, in the range of the crossover frequency that it's crossing over to the tweeter. And the tweeter at its crossover frequency, because it's so small, has extremely good dispersion at its lowest frequency. So you must be careful that if off axis, that the blend between the tweeter and the woofer is blended well without any strong art, uh, differences in the way they, their directivity is, so that that integrated sound you hear with that earlier reflection added to the direct sound doesn't have the combination of the timbre of those two. So this is where psychoacoustics plays a role in understanding how we perceive sound and what things are important in designing a loudspeaker to accommodate that. Another thing that we did, the second thing is in 1987, we did a, we did a, a project um, called Athena. Uh, and the project was to do room correction uh, create what we were calling a smart loudspeaker. And what came out of that research for me, um, the most profound thing was, since you're going to EQ or room correct uh, a loudspeaker in a room, what does that target curve for the correction need to be? And if you think about direct radiating loudspeakers and how they uh, integrate into a, um, a room, even when it's being recorded by the musicians or by the engineers and producers, they're using direct radiating loudspeakers. And in this diagram, you can see that, you know, at low frequencies, particularly the, the radiation is 360 degrees. And at higher frequencies, it becomes narrower in dispersion. So uh, it's not radiating in 360 degrees. So add up all the reflections at low frequencies or add up all the reflections at high frequencies and the energy has you know a tilt in the frequency response and we have to we, we were able to come up with and i was able to use some of that information to determine what the target curve for a loudspeaker needs to be in a room and i'll get to a little bit more as to how i how i've benefited from that knowledge in in a little further in the presentation and then i want to talk a little bit about how our brain processes signals. And one example that I can, can state here, and I'll just go to the next slide. And there's an example of what I just mentioned, and that is, uh, you know, setting up a frequency response and then tailoring that response if we did corrections for a speaker in a room. 
you have a target curve that you try and match to. And I'll explain a little more about that target curve. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the speakerphone experiment. And I'm sure everyone out there has experienced talking to someone who is on a speakerphone when you're talking to them over the phone. And when I ask people who experience that, I ask them, uh, do you know when a person on a speakerphone is talking on a speakerphone? And they say, oh, yeah, I can tell they're on a speakerphone. I say, well, how do you know they're on a speakerphone? And there's a bit of thinking there. And they say, oh, well, it's because I can hear the echo in the room. And I ask them that the question after they've observed that and say, um, when you're in that room, do you hear that echo? And they think about it for a minute and they go, well, no, I don't hear the echo when I'm in the room. I only hear it when I'm on the speakerphone. And I ask them the question, well, why do you think that is? And I usually don't get a very succinct answer. And the answer to that is that we as human beings have the ability uh, from a brain function standpoint to integrate signals that occur in very short periods of time to make them perceived as one acoustical event. And what that does is it, it's basically an evolutionary thing that we've learned to try and localize things much more accurately because we can, we can temper where the reflections are and focus on where the original signal is. And that's just a brain function and a phenomena that uh, we all, if you think about it, have experienced, but this explains what is going on in our brain or what our brain is processing. I mean, it's a, it, our ears are just pickups. Our brain is what does all the processing and comes up with all the, the uh, perceived sonic events. Um, let me just go down here. This is a much bigger presentation than I'm showing you. So um, I'm going to talk a little now. That just talks about loudspeakers and, and understanding rooms a little bit and all about psychoacoustics and some of the things taken into consideration for developing loudspeakers. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how some of that knowledge applies to development uh, of headphones that were uh, and playing music that was recorded and most music that is recorded today is recorded to be played back on speakers in a room now when you're listening to headphones that situation does not exist again um, what am I doing here Again, uh, a lot of research uh, was, you know, was done at NRC, and I, I'm going to explain um, a little experiment that I did recently at the National Research Council with regard to evaluating headphones in, for the purpose of figuring out what the target curve for headphones needs to be from a subjective listener standpoint. So I have a video that I'm going to show, uh, which kind of, the, hello? Real quick on the on the video, go ahead and turn it up because uh, just for now, because we won't get feedback because we're out of the video. So go ahead and turn it up because I think the video is coming in and playing through your speakers and being picked up by your mic. So go ahead and turn up your speakers. Oh, okay. That's interesting. You can just tell me if it's okay. So we we did a, there's no sound here right now, but we did a, a tour of some uh, press out of the United States and England and Canada uh, and invited them and hosted them for a listening session in Ottawa. And this is just some sites of Canada's capital. That's the National Art uh, Center or uh, Art Gallery. Um, 
And here is M37, which is the building that houses the Anacoa Chamber at NRC. Hi, I'm Paul Barton from PSB Speakers, and we're here at the National Research Council um, doing an experiment that's never been done at least by us before. And that is we've invited a bunch of journalists from the headphone community and the audio video community to experience um, an experiment that will really uh, demonstrate what we call room feel in our headphone designs. And what that means is uh, when you put a loudspeaker or when you put headphones on and listen to music that was recorded to be played back on loudspeakers in a room, you must compensate for this when you listen to the same music on headphones. What we're going to do here is put a pair of loudspeakers in an anechoic chamber where there is no room, and we're going to let the journalists hear what room feel sounds on a pair of loudspeakers in a dead environment, which is the same thing as listening to loudspeakers uh, or listening to headphones with room feel in them. And we're going to ask the reviewers to uh, compare different equalizations uh, or compensations for the effects that the room has and let them make judgments as to what they prefer. Hopefully they will confirm that room feel is in fact something that is uh, an improvement in listening to headphones with music that was recorded to be played back on loudspeakers in a room. Well here, we're in the Anacoa chamber right now and this is the uh, physical setup of a pair of T3s, PSB T3s, our flagship, along with a subwoofer here in the middle. Uh, the chamber, uh, of course, is anechoic, meaning it absorbs all frequencies on all the walls. And the idea here is we don't want to introduce the effects of a room in this two-channel setup. And we're going to apply um, the uh, room feel curve. And we're going to let the listeners or the, uh, the media people or the press people that are here to experience some different versions of room feel and let them choose which they prefer. And uh, what will happen here is that they will be able to listen to speakers uh, in an open space where there's no reflections, which is the same kind of situation when you put a pair of headphones on. And the idea here is to try and let them determine or realize uh, what transfer function or what target function or what equalization needs to be applied in order for them to experience what they think would be the best sound of a two-channel system when sitting in the stereo position. One thing I wanted to mention uh, as well in this test setup, there is a, a distinct difference between what the listener will experience when listening to a pair of loudspeakers in the anechoic chamber that has room feel applied to it and putting a pair of headphones on that has room feel. And the difference is they will be able to um, hear the sounds when they're listening to these speakers in the chamber, the sounds will be outside their head. Most people, oh, I would expect all people who put a pair of headphones on that was recorded to be played back on speakers in a room, that is, they're not binaural recordings, which are recorded with dummy heads, they're just normal recordings. They will experience uh, the sound when they have headphones on inside their head. So. What I think is going to be interesting when they do this experiment is that these listeners who are uh, experienced headphone listeners will be able to listen to room feel, but they'll be able to listen to room feel with the sound outside their head. And that's the difference uh, with headphones on with room feel. Headphones, because they're recorded, not, they're not recorded binaurally, the sound will be inside the head. And in this condition, it will almost be like a binaural recording with room feel. So, am I still sharing the screen? Yeah. So just to explain a little bit more um, what's going on here. Huh. I apologize, my... Uh, PowerPoint is un, unstable. Can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. 
Okay, pick up where we left off. So here are some, just some stills of the setup that we had in the anechoic chamber. And uh, I'll just talk a little bit about what I mentioned earlier about um, at low frequencies, radiation is in a direct radiating loudspeaker at low frequencies is omnidirectional and at high frequencies it becomes more directional. So if you were to look at the total energy that any given loudspeaker puts out, measuring the energy all around the loudspeaker, which in a room you effectively get some of it back because you're getting reflections off of it, makes it makes for a, a tilted frequency response given a direct radiating loudspeaker. Um, and that has to be you know, considered when designing a transfer function uh, for a loudspeaker, because if you measure a flat anechoic loudspeaker in a room, the measurement you get in a room will be boosted in the base and somewhat rolled off in the high frequency. And that's basically the challenge is determining what that sort of common ratio is. And I, I'm not saying that it's the same for all loudspeakers or it's the same for all listeners, but at least it gives us some quantitative value as to what the target curve needs to be, not only in a room, but also when you put a pair of headphones on. Um, so in the experiment, here is the T2s in the anechoic chamber. And of course, at low frequencies, the anechoic chamber <clears throat> has needs some correction, which we, which we apply when doing measurements. But I'm not applying any correction here because I want to see what the speaker is without any correction at low frequencies in the chamber. These are standing waves at, at 30 hertz and a null at 20 hertz that basically can be calculated out or averaged, uh, not averaged, but uh, subtracted out of the measurements because we do the speaker measurements in exactly the same location and the microphones are always in the same location. So the correction between those two locations can be adapted when doing real measurements in real time of loudspeakers. But in this experiment, we didn't have the speakers in the traditional location for doing measurements so I use Dirac to correct the response in the anechoic chamber in the seats where the listeners would be. And I've applied the orange curve, which is the target curve for, for compensation, uh, either for a headphone or if you're doing an EQ in a room. Um, then I applied that correction. You can see it's, it, it aligns with the green curve. So what the listeners were hearing were variations on this target curve, which I can show you what those variations were. So um, this is EQ1, and EQ1, uh, this is EQ2. So EQ1 was a boost at low frequencies and a cutoff at the higher, not a cutoff, but a, a slope at the higher frequencies. EQ2 is um, basically flat. EQ3 is only a boost in the base to compensate for the room. And four is a slightly less boost at low frequencies and a slightly less attenuation at high frequencies. So these were the four different listening conditions or EQs that the, that the listeners listened to. So there they are superimposed on, all, on each other. And here is a typical score sheet helping uh, listeners either experienced or inexperienced in, you know, kind of sorting out their thoughts and ideas and be able to go back and forth between different settings, do comparisons. It just helps to organize um, their, their th thoughts on what they hear. And then, of course, there's uh, pleasantness and fidelity, which are can be quite different sometimes. Something can be pleasant sounding but not accurate. Um, and then there's the overall fidelity. So, you know, we kind of 
use those two metrics, especially the fidelity, to determine what what the preference is for that loudspeaker or that particular sonic comparison. And here are the here are the scores. Of course, keep in mind this was a single experiment. Um, the first time I had tried it, um, it, it's got some validity, but it's not scientifically challenged by peers, etc. But the methodology, I believe, was fairly solid. The only thing you would want to do is do more and more of these tests just to see how consistent and repeatable they was. But all, all having said that, you can see that you know the, the numbers, significant difference numbers came out of this test. And you can see the variations within listeners. You can, and there were 10 listeners altogether. So just you know to come up with a, a basic conclusion, whoops. Um, what scored first was the largest boost in the bass and the largest cut at the high frequency. That was EQ1. The next score was a slightly less boost in, in cut. That's EQ4. And then EQ2 uh, got the third score. It scored the third lowest, the third score. And then uh, just a bass boost got the lowest score. So you know, that's good information to sort of use to start, um, you know, basing any more research on. Um, so in conclusion, this informal experiment was very informative to me and the group of listeners that there is some correction in the frequency response of a headphone that is necessary in order to be true to the original intent of the musicians and producers of musical or music slash sounds. Um, uh, the goal of this test was achieved in that it sh showed that there is something that is needed to compensate for the fact that listening to a loudspeaker in a room is quite different than headphone listening. This is because headphones do not have the room as a part of the audio chain. So room gain and high frequency absorption plus what I like to call my secret sauce equals what we use and apply in our headphone designs. Um, since this listening event, I've further refined uh, the room field target, and along with DSP processing, it is now the latest. It is now in the latest PSB and NAD headphones. Not only is the target curve more refined because of this blind listening test, it is now possible to dial in headphone target curves more accurately uh, when with using DSP. The original headphone that I did, which was the M4U2 and M4U1, uh, I did all the acoustic tuning for room feel in the analog or just the acoustic domain. I didn't use DSP. And so the, the latest versions have allowed me to do even a more refined calibration or setup for tuning a headphone. And this is just a picture at the M50, uh, M50 building, the head building at NRC, all of the participants in this listening test. Hey, sorry to, to jump in, Paul. Uh, do you want to leave it open a little bit for questions? Because Absolutely. I, could to you, I could listen to you all day. You know that. Uh, the only and, thing uh, yeah, we all could. Yeah. The only, the we already thing. had you on our podcast, and we, we want to make sure that you come back. So promise to do that, too. Oh, yeah. Well. This is just a, a small sampling of what I could talk about. Oh, I see your slides, 162 <laughs> slides there. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to pare some things down. Um, I just wanted to just point to one last thing uh, sure. before any questions, and that is in conjunction with the work that I have done and to develop headphones in, in parallel uh, under the direction of Sean Olive through Harmon, and certainly that's part of Floyd Tools. Uh, research group at Harman have also done work in this area on headphones. And one of the most profound things that I, I, I think is kind of cool um, is uh, this is a paper that uh, Sean Olive of Harman did along with Todd Wilty uh, and Elizabeth McMullen back in 2013. This was at an AES in Rome. Uh, the target curves include the diffuse sound field and the free sound field in ISO standard 11904-2. A modified diffuse 
field target recommended by Laura and unequalized the unequalized headphone and the new target response based on acoustical measurements of a calibrated loudspeaker system in a room. That's basically what I was arguing is that both headphones for, for head for both headphones, the new target based on in-room response was the most preferred headphone target response. So really um, we're all we're coming to sort of similar conclusions when it comes to what that relationship between listening to headphones with speakers, uh, with music that was recorded to be played back on speakers in a room, which is obviously the lion's share of recorded music. Okay. Are there, are there any questions? So I, I can just summarize that. I'm using some M4U 8s here, and these are the best sounding headphones that I have here. And so, well, yeah. That's good to hear, Joe. There, there they are on the screen. Yeah, there they are. And um, they're, an act they're also an active noise canceling headphone. It's uh, got Bluetooth uh, Aptex HD. Mm -hmm. It's definitely uh, a good headphone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Michael, why don't you uh, just go through the, the comments real quick and see if uh, there are any, because we're running real short on time, but okay. maybe a few uh, that we can address. That I'm, ba I'm, ba I'm basically finished, guys. Yeah, sure. So all I can say is thank you. <laughs> we have a, we. I know there are a lot of comments, Paul, asking you to come everybody back. Everybody wants to talk. To, yeah, <laughs> everybody wants back. to hear you. Hey, talk you know what? If you want to come back, I think we have an open spot later. Well, uh, I would be happy to expand. On you. That. Why don't we try and coordinate something? And how long? Uh, how Might many? Be able days, to... How many days are there yet? Um. Yeah. yeah. Mainly one more, like yeah. full day of schedules on but, Monday. Yeah, we'll try to figure out something. You know what? For sure, let's just have you back on our podcast because we do that every Monday. Absolutely. So that'll be easy I, to do because, I, like I'm saying, people want to hear from you yeah. well, and they want to interact maybe, with you. Yeah, maybe what we should do, Joe, is make up a list that you and I share mm -hmm. and then we'll sort of pop them off and see what your readers think. Uh, okay, okay. I'm happy to be in those great, great. Problem. So um, that's really all I had to say. Uh, are there any questions? Oh, I can see questions on the side. There's, there's a ton of questions for yeah. you there. Have you have you seen any that be worth uh, that I could answer? Um, yeah. Why don't you find some that you think you want to pop up, Michael? Um, this is. I just want to quickly mention that we have some of the products from PSB here on the Hi-Fi Summit website, and so the M4U eights are there. Here are the PSB Alpha T20s. I have the Alpha P5s, which I really like. So these are the floor standings uh, model. And oh, actually, you guys are, are giving away a pair of T20 towers. Oh, So make sure to check that out. It's on the, um, on the website. But also, there's a show special, 10% off site-wide at psbspeakers.com. So you use this coupon code here. Cool. Right? right. So it's a limited, limited time just during the hi-fi summit so thank you shout out to psb gold sponsor no problem and just to mention there is some new stuff coming in conjunction with the alpha oh yeah powered versions of them which uh, um, they actually are a complete system in one what? as a, oh as a phono, exclusive as a phono input as <laughs> a bluetooth uh h aptex it has uh optical in it has uh, analog in and um, it's a complete system so uh, there are two models there's going to be one we call the AM3 which is the active version of the Alpha P3 and then there's the uh, AM5 which is the active version of the Alpha P5 and uh, they're currently in just about to go into production so you'll hear more about those very soon I think it's going to be a hit I think it'll, it'll be a hit. You want to answer one question at least because I, I feel okay. bad. These people are, would love for your for you to answer their question. So why don't you pick one, Michael? One lucky. One lucky. There's one right here. Three cons from Arizona. When we talk about precision and accuracy with, with respect to headphones, am I sure size, shape of my ears matter? Of course they do. Oh, I'll just mention something interesting. Um, as I kind of develop and work more along 
headphones, I realized that even though you can sort of characterize how people perceive sound across all people, we all are very much individual at the same time. So the pinna and how it interacts with headphones that are put on the ear are going to be variable. And that's an area that I am definitely pursuing. There, there is going to be an app coming out for our headphones that allows the individual listener to do some, I think, fairly sophisticated uh, personalizations of the way the headphones perform, keeping in mind that room feel is the fundamental basis on which you would move from that point to make it more individual for the individual listener. So yes, the answer to that question is uh, each individual, there is variations, um, something that I see happening with in-ears where people actually mold uh, in-ears into their ear to make it more comfortable and also more consistent uh, based on their per their current ear canal. When it comes to the pinna and how the pinna behaves underneath the uh, over the ear or on the ear, those are still variables and they can vary from person to person. I think more research needs to be done in that area. But I am definitely taking that into consideration. Considering the importance of the off-axis response of a loudspeaker in a room, should an omnidirectional design be better than a normal front radiating loudspeaker? Um, unfortunately, when music is recorded, it's recorded with direct radiating loudspeakers so that the transition from what sonic event happened with an omnidirectional loudspeaker in a room and what happens with a direct radiating loudspeaker in terms of direct sound versus reflected and also time arrivals of different frequencies of different sounds. All of those things change when you make it an omnidirectional. So if the recording studio were using an omnidirectional loudspeaker and the sonic impression that they got when they were mixing with that speaker, when you play it back on that speaker, you should get the same result. One thing that an omnidirectional speaker can do is it can make it sound more spacious, but that can detract away from some of the discrete imaging that one might want to expect. So again, it's a balance, but I like to think that we keep closer to the, to the sequence of the way the recording process occurred and then the way you undo the recording when you play it back. Those two should be as close to one another as possible in order for you to appreciate what it was the original musician and engineer intended. Awesome. awesome. Hey, we love you, Paul. You're okay. the best. And uh, Chana, why don't you why don't you take us? Up? We're gonna have you back one hundred percent on our on our daily Hi-Fi podcast. Okay, just because that I is, enjoy it the most, so that I don't know about everybody else for sure. We definitely need to have you back, Paul. That was amazing. Everybody in the comments uh, loved your talk, and they want to hear you talk for three more hours. Somebody said <laughs> if this do. talk was three hours, it still wouldn't be long enough. So, <laughs> um, big thank you, Paul from PSB Speakers. Uh, to everybody, don't forget, um, this is day three of the Hi-Fi Summit. Make sure you're in the lobby discussion. Make sure you're in that uh, video chat in between sessions. We'll be back in about five minutes with KCC. Um, and uh, yeah, our journey to the top continues. See you well, soon. Good, luck. good luck with your show, the rest of your show. And uh, I, I really uh, admire the efforts you guys are doing. It's, it's great, especially especially in this in this time but Thanks, Paul. going forward i think this is a, a medium that we should should grow and and work with i definitely Thanks, enjoy it. Yes, sir. yes sir thanks guys yeah thank you